Um, so as we said last time, we know the localized translation is going to be a conserved mechanism for targeting proteins to specific regions within a cell. We saw lovely examples not only from yeast and snails and frogs, um, these are also examples that we can find in mice. So we have this nice uh, conservation as well as we have homology within some of the proteins that are going to be required. And the question that we're interested in is how are the mRNAs regulated in time and space? So this goes back to our original idea. We not only need to get them to the right place, we need to get them translated at the right time. Right? So especially in developmental biology, wrong timing is just as bad as wrong placement. We see lots of different defects uh, that'll be involved in that case. So what uh, I've worked on since my PhD is looking at Drosophila oogenesis, where this is the formation of the egg. And there's a number of different stages that we're going to go through, um, but just to break it up, there's usually what we might term early, middle, and late. Yeah. So and when you see a stage, I'm putting that in for, uh, for your own interest, but really early, middle, late. Um, they all involve cytoskeleton reorganizations, membrane proteins, all kinds of different factors. You won't be introduced to all, but if you do, just grab me. I can talk about oogenesis for hours, but I won't. <laughs> um, so those of you who aren't as familiar with the female reproductive machinery within the fly, it starts off uh, with these two very large ovaries, and we'll dissect these later today in the practical. So these large ovaries uh, consist of what are called an ovarial, and you can see one of those ovarials that's sort of been teased out. Uh, and each of these ovarials starts with a stem cell population and then has what's called an egg chamber and different stages of these egg chambers, almost like a, an assembly line to produce a mature egg. Um, then as the egg becomes ovulated, it'll pass into the lateral oviduct and then enter the common oviduct. And this is where egg activation takes place. Then once we get, oh God, this is slid, sorry. Activation should be pointed up a bit. Then we have internal fertilization once the egg has actually entered into the uterus, and that will be through stored sperm in the seminal receptacle. And then we have deposition through the vulva. Um, oftentimes, you guys might notice when you anesthetize the flies, they'll sometimes lay an egg. So that's through relaxation of the vulva that that will take place. And just a little precursor to what we'll be doing this afternoon. Um, what you'll end up doing in order to remove the ovary is simply grab the fly by the anterior of the abdomen, pull off her posterior, almost like taking, you know, tankards, uh, like those beer tankards from Germany, where you pull the, pop the top, yeah, just like one of those, um, except slightly different ones inside. Uh, and then you're just going to squeeze gently with your forcept, and it's almost like taking toothpaste out of a, out of a tube, yeah, you just gently squeeze. And the ovary will then, actually both ovaries, will stick to the tip of your forcep. You can then drop it into oil. Once it's in the oil, we'll use a probe or you'll use the forcep to then basically tug on the ovarium. And what you see here is a picture starting in the dromerium, these very young stages. <clears throat> yeah? Then you see a stage four, a stage six, what we might term early or pre-vitilogenic oogenesis. And then you see here a nice stage nine, which is going to have these different cell types, which I'll mention in a moment. And you're starting to see some autofluorescence there of the yolk. All right, so this is the bane of my existence as a graduate student because the yolk, the source of energy, source of food and nutrients for the developing egg, autofluoresces in the same exact wavelength as GFP. And I have met with numerable microscopists telling me, oh, I can unmix that. Oh, yeah. I'll unmix the channels. We'll do it after they're full of it. They can't. All right, so um, I think. I haven't actually asked in the last couple of years, but last time I tried, uh, you really do have this yolk autofluorescing, and that's this sort of mid oogenesis that you can see there. So at this stage, we have these three different population of cells. So one group of cells are called the nurse cells, and these are going to be four, uh, sorry, 15 cells, 15 cells that are going to produce RNA and protein and all of the things that are going to be needed by the oocyte. Right? And they're going to be interconnected between these 16 germline-derived cells, known as a 16-cell cyst. And that's due to incomplete cytokinesis. So if you remember from your cell biology, when cells divide, they cytokines, yeah? And that's through an actin action to then pinch them off to become two. These have incomplete cytokinesis, so what you're left with is a ring, yeah? What's called a ring canal that keeps these cells interconnected. 
And so this means that these nurse cells, and you can see the nurse cell nuclei here, are producing these RNA and protein, and they're connected to the oocyte so that these components can then be emptied into the oocyte. And here are some examples. The RNAs are being produced within the nurse cells. Then once they enter into the oocyte, they get taken to specific destinations. So some of the more famous examples, uh, we have Oscar RNA at the posterior, Gherkin RNA at the dorsal anterior corner at this stage, and bicoid RNA along the anterior cortex. And we'll get back into Gherkin and bicoid in quite some detail in a moment. Then when we get into late oogenesis, you have these two very dramatic events. The nurse cells go through program cell death. All right, so they're going to die. All of their cytoplasm will be pushed into the oocyte, and that's an actin-dependent event known as nurse cell dumping. And at the same time, the oocyte starts to mix like a washing machine, just churning the oocyte and mixing it up. And that's a microtubule-driven event called streaming. And by the end of oogenesis, what we're left with is a larger egg, so this oocyte, with localized components to the posterior, localization at the anterior. Uh, you also notice this dorsal appendage, which is a breathing tube that's been secreted. Um, you might notice uh, in some of your different mutants, you'll see these uh, dorsal appendages can be a bit misformed, misshapen. Typically, uh, a nice, easy way to look uh, in the embryo for a patterning defect within the egg. Um, but what you have here is something that is basically pushed on pause. So it simply stopped. And there were experiments done a couple decades ago where they glued the posterior of the female closed. And they left her for a month. And then they removed this block, and the female could lay an egg, and it would develop perfectly fine. So this is quite remarkable to think about, but these eggs are really just, they're, they're being held within the female, and they can basically be hit, stopped. And, and then we wait for this trigger to turn on development. And that trigger is something that the lab's actually been working on more recently, and I'll just give you two slides on that. <coughs> so if I mentioned we have this event called activation. And you guys, have anybody heard of egg activation before? Maybe? What do you know about egg activation? Tell me something. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I put you on the spot. What a, what a jerk. Well, um, I think it happens uh, independently from fertilization. So in Drosophila, this event is independent of fertilization. So activation takes place before this internal fertilization. But in most animals, it's associated with the sperm entering into the egg. So in mammals, in frogs, um, in, in mammals, you have something called PLC zeta that's going to come in and it's going to trigger then a release of calcium within the, the mammalian egg. In all systems, we've seen calcium being released at egg activation. And it's thought that this calcium release is important or this wave of calcium is important in order to trigger all the different events like blocking polyspermy, turning on RNAs, restructuring the cytoplasm, uh, or the cytoskeleton, I should say. And what you're seeing here is a Drosophila egg that we've taken out, and we've treated it with a buffer that mimics activation. So you can see that it's swelling quite rapidly. The dorsal appendage is standing up, and that's due to this, uh, to this expansion in terms of the volume. Um, you also notice that it's rounding here uh, at the posterior and at the anterior. And so I was very curious to look at what calcium might be doing and I assumed this had been done in Drosophila, but it turned out no one had actually looked at this previously. So we took advantage of a, a construct from the nervous system, so GCAMP. So this is a calmodulin bound to a GFP with an M13 linker that's been put into the barrel of the GFP that keeps it quenched effectively until the binding of calcium to calmodulin pulls this linker out and allows us to see the fluorescence. And so using this genetically encoded calcium indicator, uh, we were able to visualize uh, this calcium wave that passes through the Drosophila egg at activation. And this is now on repeat, so it's a single wave. We've been doing lots of analysis on it. It is not what I'm here to talk about, but if you do have curiosity, we're now trying to figure out which channels are required. Um, we believe it's trip channels. We also believe it's um, osmotic pressure because we've mimicked it with a number. It's not external calcium. We can see that it actually allows for translation of RNA. It also allows for... Um, the, the beginning of the, the finishing of meiosis as well. Uh, but if you're curious, I'll talk about that later. Um, after we get through activation, we then feed the sperm through what's called the micropile, which you can barely see. Uh, <laughs> All right, so the micropile is this, this, this very unique structure that, leaves, that allows for the female then to put 
uh, the sperm. And the sperm tail, which you'll notice here, the whole thing is stuffed into the egg. And you can see it here labeled in the GFP. And Drosophilids have the largest, at least the last time I checked, sperm to body ratio in the animal kingdom. There are some uh, of the tropical versions that have sperm that are uh, centimeters long. Yeah. So in, just the, in Melanogaster, I think it was, um, they're 1.8 millimeters long. Right? Which is huge when you consider the size of the fly. Uh, and there's lots of different hypotheses that you might be able to block right, other sperm from jumping the queue. Yeah? So that's why you might have a really long tail. They do swim along uh, within the seminal receptacle as well. Um, but yes, spermatogenesis is fascinating, but uh, I don't really under, well, I, I, I haven't worked on it before. Um, but that whole sperm tail gets thread within the female. It's also thought that that could be important for the uh, tubulin also, so you're getting this extra tubulin from the sperm tail. Yeah? Yeah, good question. Do you think they can also um, have different type of sperms in this uh, fiber that you were showing? I mean, and why? So they, they, Drosophila, from what I understand, they do not see polyspermy. So you don't see multiple sperms. So something, and it's not really well understood. Um, they, they tried decades ago to try to do IVF with Drosophila, and they just were not successful. Um, we're considering it again now because of the activation component. But yeah, they, the female somehow is regulating a single sperm to get in. Um, how that happens is not clear. Um, we've tried it, just tucking them. Uh, if you just put the eggs and the sperm together and see if it can just kind of find the micropile, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, it's also fairly quick, too, because you can lay an egg every 12 minutes uh, when you're really in strong conditions and the right temperature. Um, so we have this lovely fertilization event. Um, we've activated the egg, so everything's now off and running. All these localized transcripts are being translated. All this paused egg is now um, fully uh, developing. Then we get into the early embryo, and we'll hopefully look at some embryos as well today. Uh, you're going to then have what's called a syncytial blastoderm. So this is many nuclei in a single cytoplasm. Yeah. And you might also see this from uh, muscle cells. Yeah. This is another example where you might see multiple nuclei in a single cytoplasm. And you can see here that you've got the yolk in the middle, your anterior determinants of the anterior, posterior determinants of the posterior. You're going through 14 divisions, and then these nuclei around division 10 migrate to the periphery, and then they will cellularize. And it's important to remember that these gradients that form, so morphogenetic gradients or morphogens, were really, uh, have been studied extensively in Drosophila. So as they form, you might have a different concentration of protein or RNA here versus here. And that then allows when these membranes form to then cellularize to have different concentrations, which lead to different outcomes. And I can't resist but show, this is a, a beautiful movie. It was, uh, it was basically a microscopy film, but it's a light sheet. And uh, what you're gonna see here is embryogenesis in Drosophila. So we've labeled all the nuclei, they're around the outside. And then you see what, uh, what some developmental biologists call the most important moment of your life, which is here. And that's gastrulation. So that's the pole cells moving. You see the germ band extending, so just off a long germ insect. That's this extension all the way around to the top. You have your head furrow forming. So this is the head structure there on the left. You can see all these different types of cells becoming. You start to see segmentation. Yeah? It's this patterning of the segments and the parasegments. Now you're watching the germ band retract. Right? You can still see the head. Now you've got very beautiful segments forming. These are then going to be important for uh, having the different parts of the larva. You're now seeing the posterior structures. Um, you're about to watch dorsal closure. So on the dorsal side, so the top side, we're going to see a, 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 an important um, here becomes what's called zipper, which is a non-muscle myosin protein that's going to now zip up the uh, anterior, uh, sorry, the dorsal side. We've got macrophages moving along there, these hemocytes chewing up everything. Uh, and now you've got nice segmentation. We start to get the twitching, which means that we're about ready to exit uh, the eggshell and, and take on that first instar larva. Um, twitch, 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 twitch. I, don't know. I think it's a really cool movie, so um, it's definitely worth checking out. There's also other wonderful ones on fly, uh, fly base, that, uh, sorry, interactive fly, that can show you all of that. Just one more time, you can see the post, I won't show the whole thing, but there's the, those are the pole cells uh, moving and invaginating. All right, so when we look at localized RNA, we can see uh, just some nice examples with bicoid. We get the protein and the RNA localized to the anterior. 
So the anterior pole RNA is present. We translate the RNA, it gives us this gradient, then it's cellularization. We have a high concentration of bicoid versus a low concentration of bicoid. It's going to start to divide up the embryo very broadly. That's your maternal contribution. Then you're going to go for the gap genes, the payroll genes, segment polarity genes to divide it up even more so. That's work of Yanni, Eric, and so forth. Um, we can see what happens to uh, uh, the cuticle prep. So this is a preparation that shows you the different uh, parts of the uh, developing embryo or developing uh, larva. And you can see, in fact, here that you've basically lost the head in a bicoid mute. So this sort of uh, motivates you to want to learn a little more about what's going on with this gradient. The way we started studying it originally, um, almost 12 years ago now, was using this MS2 system. And so just to remind you, we have these stem loops inserted into the UTR. That's one component. Second component's the uh, either GFP construct fused to the MS2 coat protein, or we can use an RFP construct to get away from the yolk issue. And when they're co-expressed in the same cell, uh, within the same fly, you now have labeled your RNA. And here I can now show you some of the movies that we were able to capture. Um, and this was really quite exciting at the time. No one had seen live RNA uh, moving within Drosophila, uh, especially during oogenesis. We are also now able to look later in oogenesis and define an entire uh, new localization phase for bicoid, um, where the majority of the RNA localizes. And you can see here the RNA dancing around and running at a short distance. So these are RMPs moving. Um, we could show that they required um, the dynein motor, the cytoskeleton. They're also being anchored then towards the end as you see them start to actually form larger structures there at the anterior. You could also look live and, and start to hypothesize what might be happening with the motors. And in this movie, you see a particle moving, pausing for a second, and then totally changing directions. And this suggests, perhaps, that we have multiple microtubules, and it's moving on one, pausing, relinking, and moving on another. Um, and this is all, I can't highlight this enough, all done in vivo. So this is live, living, full-sized egg chambers. Yeah? So this is, this is not something that we were, uh, we were finicking or playing with other than using the MS2 system, which we showed also fully rescued the bicoid null phenotype, which means that uh, the RNA, even with all those proteins decorating it, could still be translated and could still develop a fully functioning embryo. And uh, long story short, uh, Daniel's lab in Cambridge kind of re-looked at bicoid localization 10 years after we had and effectively found something very, very similar. So they'd used really high, fancy equipment and uh, sort of state-of-the-art microscopy to effectively show that we're still getting the RNA moving on the microtubules and at the uh, in the anterior, they will associate with uh, these biomolecular condensates, and then later on, they're going to form these larger associations anchored, waiting to be translated. Um, so that was actually quite nice to see. And I mentioned there a little bit about these processing bodies. And so we've, we've seen now how the RNA can become localized. Now I want to focus in on looking at this translation regulation that I began to introduce with uh, protein phase phases as well um, in the first lecture. And so this is just to remind you now, um, for the next section we'll be looking at this mid-stage egg chamber where you have the nurse cells and the oocyte, and then around the outside is a follicular layer of cells called the follicle cells. These are somatically uh, derived, and they're going to be important for signaling. Uh, and I don't want to get too far into it, but they're a really nice uh, epithelial model. So that's what you see here, these follicle cells. And so the RNA is being made pushed into the, um, emptied into the oocyte, localized within the oocyte. And so to try to understand what's happening in terms of translation, we started focusing in on these processing bodies. And these are cytoplasmic structures that are going to be hubs or important areas for RNA regulation. Now, it was originally thought, because of the presence of DCP1, a decapping protein, that they were going to be regions solely for degradation. And this was proposed uh, in the yeast model from Roy Parker's lab. Uh, and so there you see DCP1 and DCP2. Uh, however, more recent lab, especially from, uh, um, from a number of labs who have done some purifications, suggests rather that they can store RNA. So it's a place for the RNA to go. It could be degraded based on this protein, or it might be exiting to be retranslated. And some of the work that we've worked on looks at that as well. Uh, and you can see these P-bodies within a cell. Uh, a lot of this work has been done uh, in tissue culture. Um, and you can see the key proteins that are sort of associated. Now, 
Peabody's and stress granules have been looked at, and this is simply to show you that there is lots of interaction between these two different structures. So stress granules can be very dynamic. Uh, these are going to be formed when you put the, uh, the cells of the animal under different levels of stress. Uh, RNA will go there to be either degraded or to be stored briefly. Uh, then these will also associate with Peabody's, and so the two can actually come together and begin to exchange things, and it's thought that this exchange um, is important then to decide what to do with these different components, not only the protein, but the RNA that are inside these biomolecular condensates. Um, also, in some cases, uh, the Parker labs show that they undergo autophagy as well. So there's ways of then taking large groups of them, um, and that's all been work done um, by Roy's lab within yeast. And so we've been now trying to explore Peabody's instead of using the in vitro work that a lot of the physicists have explored and the fluid dynamics, instead of using something like yeast, can we adopt and look at this within the oocyte and the embryo? And this is very recent work from a grad student uh, in the lab who actually just took a late stage egg chamber versus a late stage embryo. And looking at the Peabody labeled here with ME31B, he actually just started to notice there's a huge difference between the size and in terms of the shape. And this is indicative of these different phases, so either a, a gel or a liquid. We've also done a, a number of FRAP experiments, which I won't show you, where you can either FRAP the entire particle or a subsection of the particle. So this is fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, which is, uh, which is used to see if there's exchange or new protein coming in. Uh, and he shows very nicely that in the oocyte, you get very low recovery and very slow recovery, suggesting that it's a more stable uh, structure versus here in the embryo, uh, where you actually see recovery uh, within about a minute, minute and a half. So really rapid recovery, suggesting then uh, that these smaller ones have uh, less organized and are sort of less uh, heavily uh, structured. We've also done some biochemistry with it, and it's early days on this, but within the oocyte, you see this nice smear uh, when we look, which is suggesting that they're coming in many different shapes. They have lots of different proteins associated. Whereas in the early embryo, we actually only get one size which suggests that we're actually starting to break down. And we're really not sure what could be going on here, um, but it does think that we're actually knocking down a lot of the ME31B that's present, um, which fits with what we're seeing in fluorescence. And work that we'd uh, previously been examining at Peabody's really started to hint at this types of translational control that you can get. So using the mid-stage egg chamber, we looked at two RNA, so bicoid at the anterior, gherkin at the dorsal anterior corner, and we know that gherkin RNA is being translated at this stage, while bicoid RNA is not being translated. And you can see here, this is in situ hybridization on a, a thinly sliced cryo, uh, well, frozen sections, and we've done uh, immuno, uh, well, we've done an in situ on those sections. And you can see the dark area, which we've outlined, is, uh, is a processing body, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and you now have two different areas that we see the RNA present in. One is inside the processing bodies, and gherkin RNA appears to be on the edge. This will be important in a moment. One of the keys to a processing body is they're devoid of ribosomes. So they lack a membrane, um, but they just don't allow ribosomes in. So we, we believe them then to be regions that are not allowing for translation. Yeah. So it's a place where you can put the RNA um, to keep it away from the ribosomes. We then we're able to use super resolution microscopy, so this is um, structured illumination. And when we look at bicoid and our Peabody marker, they're together. Yeah. When we look at gherkin and our Peabody marker, we, we sort of get this nice sort of intercalated, what we might argue is a bit of an edge effect, um, which was nice because people were constantly asking us to redo this in fluorescence versus EM, uh, just because of the live aspect that we're trying to take. So all this work resulted in a model that, that is as follows. You can take an RNA and store it. So we can take bicoid RNA, put it into a Peabody at the anterior, it will be kept off. At the same time, we're in a similar Peabody even, you can have gherkin RNA which will localize, it associates with the edge, and we've shown that there's key factors that are important for activating translation that are localized along the edge of the Peabody. So we're actually able to look at different parts of Peabodies and looking at a core versus an edge, and we've done all types of analysis on those proteins. And what happens then along the edge is they can associate with ribosomes, and they can go on and be translated. So this is a nice model to, to play with and to think about. 
But it got us thinking and wondering what is actually happening to limit translation within the nurse cells. So why and how are we keeping these RNA off in the nurse cells? Because we don't want them to be translated ectopically until they reach their destination, in the case of Gherkin, at the dorsal anterior corner. So what's the, what's the classic way you might think to regulate an RNA? What if, what, if you listen to the first bit, what could happen to keep an RNA translationally off, for example, during the transport? Yep. So you can do something with poly tail, you can do something with capping. You basically can have what we might term a repressor present. Yeah. So bind a repressor, and now as you move, you're kept off. Or you can keep the ribosomes off, but some protein would be associated. And with, uh, with gherkin, we knew that there was quite a history of, of different proteins that are thought to be required. So we looked um, at things like Aret, we looked at Bruno, we took all the different expected gherkin translational repressors, all these uh, repressor factors, and we found that uh, also squid, for example, that when we look here in the nurse cell for the gherkin protein, it is black. And we have turned these up to try to figure it out, but all you see in the wild type is gherkin at the dorsal anterior corner. And also here in these different mutants, you're only getting expression within the nurse cell, oh sorry, within the oocyte. So we're still not getting the expression within the nurse cells as you'd predict. And we went through and we, we played with pretty much everything we could think of. And this left us in a bit of a, uh, uh, a situation where we really weren't sure what was going on. And then we went back and started flicking through the EM scans. And what we noticed was there's a very important protein, and I know some of you are looking at it, called ORB within Drosophila. And this is a cytoplasmic polyadenylation element uh, binding protein. So CPEB, these are conserved. Uh, and CPEBs will bind to this poly A tail and will then help to uh, establish translation, recruiting ribosomes, and so forth. And we noticed in the nurse cells, within these P bodies that were present, you had very, very low orb expression. Whereas in the oocyte, you had orb being localized to these processing bodies. And we actually looked, it's more dense along the edges than in the core. So this is them fitting with the model that we have an activator now being localized, but it's only within the oocyte, and we're not seeing it within the nurse cells. So this then raised the question, since we couldn't find a repressor, is Gherkin translation being controlled by access to the translational initiator, or to ORB? And I wouldn't be telling you the story if that wasn't the case. <laughs> So you have a nice example of the wild type. You can see the nurse cells um, that are very, very dark. And you see expression of gherkin protein in the uh, dorsal anterior corner. We then overexpressed orb using the UAS GAL4 system. And overexpression of orb, we could not only see an increase in the amount of orb in the nurse cells, but we also start to see gherkin protein being ectopically expressed within these nurse cells. And you'll see, hopefully a little bit, you can see there's a little bit of a fine line there because gherkin is secreted. And so we see it actually along the membranes in these nurse cells. And then another approach we took was to take a repressor of orb, which is cup. So we took a cup mutant. And cup is known to keep orb off in the nurse cells. So if you take a cup mutant, you now get orb expression within the nurse cells. And we could then see uh, that gherkin protein is also being expressed within those nurse cells. You can see it quite nicely there in the membranes. To test then the model of whether or not it's an association with the processing bodies, we first looked at a UAS orb in the nurse cells. Right? So we've overexpressed orb, and we can see that it is interacting sort of along this, um, in the holes basically where the P bodies are. So we see that they're actually not fully co-localizing, but rather, again, associating with what we predict to be an edge. And then we did single molecule fish in the wild type nurse cell, and then in a nurse cell that's overexpressing orb. And in the wild type nurse cell, you can see that the P bodies labeled in green do not appear to be associating with the RNA labeled in red. Whereas when we overexpressed orb and we got translation of the RNA, you're now starting to see these RNAs associating with the edges of the P bodies. And so this gave us, brought us to a working model where low levels of orb within the nurse cells um, are going to then lead to uh, translational repression or a, loss, uh, or a lack of translation. 
Whereas then in the, uh, in the oocyte, once it becomes localized, we're getting RNA associated with the edge of the P-bodies. That's going to then put the RNA in contact with this translational activator, the CPV protein orb, and then it's going to allow for the ribosomes to come in uh, and actually produce gherkin protein. We went a little bit further because there's different types of orb within the oocyte. We actually found that uh, there's a specific kinase that's important at the dorsal anterior corner to phosphorylate orb to then allow for the phosphorylated orb to specifically only turn on gherkin at the DA corner. This is all fine and good, but it left us feeling a bit wanting. Um, what we really want is to monitor translation in vivo. We want to see translation taking place. And I mentioned a few tricks that could be used using this MS2 system. And around the time we were working on this within cells, um, the Singer Lab in collaboration with Anna Frusi's lab at Embel, were able to publish a new technique that could allow you to watch the pioneer round of translation within a cell. And what they used, uh, and they termed it trick, is you have the RNA, <clears throat> it has the coding sequence, and it has some of these stem loops within the coding region. And those stem loops, in this case PC, uh, PP7 loops, will then bind to the coprotein, which you can see here tagged with GFP. So within the coding region, you have uh, some green. Then outside in the 3' UTR, you now have the MS2 stem loops bound with an MS2 coprotein, so they are now going to be labeled in red. So the RNA, before it is translated, so pre-pioneer round of translation, will appear yellow. However, when the ribosome comes flying through the first time, it will knock off the coat protein that's bound to the stem loops within your coding region. So the first ribosome will knock off this protein that's associated, and our RNA will now go from yellow to red. And so in collaboration with Ann's lab and uh, with Frank Whippich, who's postdoc doing a lot of this work, we were able to get a hold of these constructs and try to watch translation of bicoid RNA. And we had thought it has something to do with these processing bodies, and we were able to show that when we activate the egg, these processing bodies fall apart, which would fit with the model of the RNAs being stored. When you activate, the processing body falls apart. Now you can actually get translation. And in the embryo, we could, we could do um, some, some live imaging here, and you could see that the RNA, especially the arrow, is now no longer co-localizing, which is fine. What we really want to do is use this trick system. And what we showed, um, or what we're still working on, obviously, is pre-activation. Um, the RNA is untranslated because we, uh, we've got the, uh, shown in white here, this co-localization along the anterior. So we're happy. We see that, in fact, both of the components are present. And then when we activate the egg, very quickly, we see going from yellow, so pre-activation, so this is untranslated RNA, and post-activation, you see that it now is showing up red. So we actually believe this then to be the first round of translation has come through, and this RNA has been translated within about the first two minutes um, post-activation. And as the control for this, um, we would look at pre-activation, post-activation, but in this activation buffer we put in cyclohexamide, which is then going to block the ability for ribosomes to come through and make that protein. And so by um, stalling these ribosomes uh, on the RNA, we see in fact that we're now left with um, uh, maintaining that yellow, which means we not only have the uh, coprotein outside the, the coding region, but also inside of the coding region. This is all work in progress. We're trying to to now get P-bodies in as well, so we can look at all three. It is not trivial. Um, there are many, many constructs, and these flies are not very happy to be alive when they do live. Um, but it's quite an exciting time because, you know, as, uh, within the field, the, the idea of actually being able to watch this translation is, is really quite, um, yeah, it, it's got us pretty, pretty motivated. One of the places we then wanted to test our model. So this model that it gets to the edge, if this is the P-body as the table, I'm the RNA, I get to the edge, I now become translated. Yeah, I can go inside then and become degraded. Right? Or I can go inside, be stored, activate. Uh, so we wanted to test this model on a different tissue. So we've just started this work now, and we're looking at these cells around the outside of the developing embryo. 
And specifically here, we can see the nuclei, here's our cytoplasm, and we know that certain RNAs get localized to the apical side. So we asked, the first question was, are there Peabody's there? I'd shown you previously the Peabody's fall apart, but here are the Peabody's localized to one side or the other. And here we actually see these Peabody's being in larger structures along the apical side versus here on the basal side of these cells. And you can see the dark spots, these are the developing, uh, the nuclei as they divide. So first off, we thought, okay, we've got some Peabody's, they're in the right place. Are they associating with the RNA? Uh, and so then we went through and we looked at uh, a parallel RNA, so it doesn't matter which one. It shows these lovely stripes, yeah, the parallels. So this is uh, uh, one example. And then we looked at Peabody's, and this is ME31B, and you're starting to actually, maybe if you squint a bit, you start to see stripes as well. So this is now very intriguing to think that the certain RNAs are going to then associate and be translationally regulated um, by the processing body. So here you can see then if we go into a deeper section, so you can see where the RNA would be in these nice seven stripes, you can see that the Peabody's do appear to be slightly enriched along the apical side. So then the obvious question is, are they associating? So if we look here at FUTS RNA, and we've blown this up and zoomed in quite a bit. But we've done now a hybrid chain reaction, so the RNA shouldn't be too large. We haven't oversized it in terms of the amplification step. But you now start to notice that the RNA doesn't really um, fully co-localize with the p bodies, but again, being very cautious, does appear to be somewhat associated with the edges. Whereas on the basal side, where we don't think the RNA is being translated, which previous work has shown, we notice that the RNAs are now at some distance from the p bodies. And so we're going through, we've, we've done all the numbers on it, but now we're testing different RNAs in different stripes and at different times. Uh, the model that we like in some ways is the RNA here is unassociated, it associates with the edge of the Peabody on the apical side, becomes translated, and then it enters into the Peabody and becomes degraded. And so we actually have a little bit of evidence that uh, shows we get more localization inside the Peabody as we go later. And the last little vignette um, I'll tell you about is also looking at how this translation of Bicoid, just going back to Bicoid, could be regulated. And this is a totally different avenue for us. Um, what we're trying to do now is go from these large structures where we have P bodies and RNA, and then in the early embryo we get this RNA now nice and diffuse along the anterior, and we get this nice translation. So what is it that's allowing for this to happen? And I've told you about P bodies. We started a collaboration with a couple of guys from Oxford at the time when I was a postdoc, and it's continuing now. So Tudor Folga uh, is the PI at the Weatherall Institute, and, uh, and Bruno is a very talented uh, graduate student um, in his lab. And we sat down to try to, to, to answer this question, and Tudor had historically worked in David Van Vector's lab at Harvard working on microRNAs. Yeah. So they were interested in, and this got us thinking about microRNAs regulating Bitcoin translation. And I'll give you the, uh, some of the storyline about uh, where we are on this project. So bicoid translation is thought to be associated with polyadenylation. So work from 1994 had shown the longer poly A tail once you get into the early embryo. So this suggested that you need this polyadenylation in order to get translation. Then more recent work actually made the argument um, that there's a key polyadenylase called GLAD2. Uh, whose homologue is known as WISPY within Drosophila, and that it's going to be required because when we get rid of uh, WISPY, we then lose translation uh, and we lose this nice uh, organization of the RNA. However, both of these uh, studies uh, were sort of undermined to an extent by uh, work from the Bartel lab, and this is uh, a number of papers that they've published looking at polyadenylation on a, on a global scale. Uh, and so what they actually show is before and after egg activation, there's really a minor increase in the amount of, uh, um, uh, in terms of the length of the poly A tail. And this suggests actually that it's not about polyadenylation. It actually fits with what we were seeing in terms of the speed of translation, because if you think about polyadenylation, it would actually take a little while to get to this 140 in terms of while, I mean minutes, but longer than we were seeing this translation taking place. Um, and so what we then started off doing to ask a question about whether or not microRNAs could be involved was we went and we looked to see what microRNAs um, could be present at the different stages in oogenesis. 
So we went through and we actually uh, dissected and then chopped up pre-stage nine, stage nine, this stage 10 to 13, and stage 14. We put them into uh, different sample tubes, and then we went through and we ran a nanostring on it. And so we did this nanostring, which is in, uh, a way of then looking at what uh, concentrations of the different reads that we wanted. What came back to us uh, was a very exciting list from the nanostring and the counts at these different stages. Uh, and we were able to actually show that a number of microRNAs uh, were present in Bicoid um, and actually within the ovary in these different uh, stages of oogenesis. And some of these you'll notice are located, um, these are predicted sites then for where the microRNA might bind to the actual RNA, so these are the RNA recognition elements. And so here we see that we get a nice 7 mer, for example, or a, an 8-7 eight, uh, eight mer. So this is the, this, the amount of, uh, of binding that's being predicted. And we can see where these things are localized to, or predicted to be localized to. So these simply are predictions, and they show us that these microRNAs are actually present within the different stages of oogenesis. So next we wanted to test if these predicted sites are deprotected between oogenesis and embryogenesis. So the model that we might predict is the microRNA comes on, binds to the RNA, yeah, it's repressing it. Then once we get to the embryo, the microRNA is then removed, right? And that allows them for translation. So we should see a difference in terms of the protection between the oocyte and the embryo. Uh, and that is exactly, uh, in fact, what we found. So to test this, um, we did some in vivo mapping where we designed an oligonucleotide to target the site and then test for stability uh, with RNA-SH. And what we were over, overall able to find is that in the embryo, you had more accessibility to these sites than in the oocyte. So here's the difference between the accessibility and the sensitivity. Within the embryo, it's going to be more sensitive than in the oocyte. And what this predicts then is that in the oocyte, we actually have the RNA already there, bound, this microRNA which then means uh, we're not able to protect in the same way. So again, this is uh, a quite an intriguing place to look now because we've mapped on the microRNAs to the different parts of the 3' UTR. And if you put in the predicted localization element for Bicoid, it lies basically around 170 to about 650 uh, on the 3' UTR. And so these are actually lying just outside in some cases, especially 989, which we're really intrigued by. So this is now, again, some nice preliminary work, um, but we really need to focus in on these microRNA recognition elements. And can we actually look uh, specifically and show that the microRNA is physically binding to bicoid RNA? Right? So these are predictions. We want to see, are they actually binding together? And this is then where Bruno um, went through and looked at what's called the bicoid interactome. So he made and this took quite some time, but he went through and he did these small RNA interactions and he looked to see, in fact, um, could he basically pull down the microRNA? And so it started off with some cross-linking from dissected ovaries. Um, we then incubate uh, with the, these different oligonucleotides. Uh, we're then able to do a magnetic purification, so we're then able to pull out the RNA, and then we're able to then release and make a library with the hope that we'd find the microRNAs that had been bound to the bicoid RNA. And when you look through at what came out, you know, tens of thousands of reads or hundreds of thousands of reads, um, you see a number of different uh, uh, types of RNA that are there. But key here, we see a certain level, about 2%, um, from the bicoid pull down were microRNAs. Um, so from that point, we now want to look at specifically what they are and how enriched they are. What I'm showing you here is a number of these microRNAs that are heavily enriched um, when comparing the bicoid pull down to other RNA. And so these microRNAs, so MIR-184, MIR-989, MIR-311, um, these are the number of counts that we saw, and they're heavily abundant, which then is fitting in with the idea Right, that these are the microRNAs that could be bound to keep bicoid translationally repressed. We then went forward, and you could do some predicted pairing, and some of these have really lovely pairing structures, so they have a number of uh, parts to this seed element that's going to be recognized. You have a wobble group in some cases. Uh, in the microRNA field, these 
for MIR 989 would be considered very, very highly uh, stable and, and likely places for this uh, binding to occur. At this point then, um, we started uh, within my lab, we, we then are now building, um, we're building a number of reporters because this is all great, it's all mostly predictive, we know that it can bind to the RNA, we now need to show the function. So we need to show, in fact, when we take away this microRNA uh, binding region, it can actually lead to ectopic translation. So we're building a number of, um, of these uh, reporter constructs right now in the lab. We're also going through and we're CRISPRing out um, these predicted regions for binding in the RNA. Both of those, unfortunately, I can't tell you where, uh, well, I can tell you where we are, but we haven't actually gotten to the point where we can show you that there is translation. Um, but that's work from a, a couple of uh, students within the lab right now. <clears throat> so at this point, uh, I will close and take a few questions before we go to lunch. These are the people that I've worked with. Obviously, I'm still in touch with Liz, which is great. It speaks to when you have a good advisor and you get on well. Um, it is a lifelong relationship. Uh, Tudor, uh, who I actually met on a neurobiology course in Japan in 2010. And then five years later, he emailed me and he was moving to Oxford. And now we still stay in contact regularly and collaborate. So share your email addresses with the people in the room. Yeah, the, the interactions you have here will actually these are the people your careers will interact with. Um, I've been really fortunate to just be around great advisors that have really been inspirational. Um, Alex did all the work on Gherkin um, in the O site, and Richard's been a longtime friend. Uh, he's a microscopy genius, uh, Scottish guy. He looks like uh, Willie from The Simpsons. Um, this is him holding a cod, which he then quickly took the head off of afterwards, which was quite unnerving. Um, but Richard and I have been collaborating for now almost 10 years. Um, this is us, so this is a little, uh, we're not this large because we have too many undergrads around. Um, but uh, within the lab, uh, about six of us now, uh, number of students, these are people who've come through the lab who've been really quite useful, and, and some of the work I showed today was involving it. These are different collaborators. Um, when you're small, it's great to collaborate. So these are people who we've been working with. Uh, these are people who've given us money over the years. Uh, and just to say thanks also to the zoology basement, which is a great place to work. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know, it's a basement, it's awful. Um, but we like to say it's a great place to work. <laughs> uh, and at this point, I'll take any questions. <laughs>